Hello, my name is Ruben Major. I'm an instructor, program director for Arizona, and chief executive officer for EMS University. In this relatively short uh, section, we're going to be discussing the initial assessment under patient assessment for the EMT. The general impression of the patient is the first thing you're going to want to do in this particular area. So remember, this is the initial assessment. This is once you've made contact with the patient. The definition is that the general impression is formed to determine the priority of care and is based on the EMT, EMT's immediate assessment of the environment and the patient's chief complaint. So this is a very, very rapid uh, determination of what it is exactly that's going on with the patient. You're not going into anything that is very much in depth. However, you are going to make a determination as to whether or not there is a medical issue at hand or whether this is a traumatic injury. Additionally, you're going to want to determine some very, very basic information, including the patient's age, sex, and then other factors. You should begin forming your general impression of the patient as you are approaching him or her. As for the assessment, you're going to assess the nature of the illness, NOI, or the mechanism of injury, MOI. You want to assess the patient and determine if they have a life-threatening condition. Remember, this is just a very cursory overview of the situation for the patient. You'll want to take uh, C-spine precautions if necessary. Basically, you're going to take manual inline neutral stabilization of the spine, which is just your hands on the head and supporting the neck to make sure that there's no spinal compromise. You'll also want to assess the patient's mental status at this point. Um, what it, is it exactly that they're able to answer for you? Are they alert to verbal? Are they alert to painful? Are they alert uh, just in general? Or are they unconscious? And if they are, um, if they're alert to verbal, um, or not alert to verbal, but if they're alert and oriented, how are they alert oriented? Are they able to answer person, place, time, and events? In some location, uh, they will also want you to make a mental determination of those specific criteria and then make a determination as whether or not the patient has competency as well. As some jurisdictions will say that it's okay for you to have a patient that is competent to refuse as long as they're able to answer at least three of those questions. So person, place, time, and event. Again, the, the standards vary depending on where the patient is at or where, the, where you're at um, and what your local protocol might be. But for the most part, these are the considerations that you'll want to, want to think about when assessing the uh, how alert the patient actually is. Alert to verbal doesn't mean that I can converse with the patient. It just means that they wake up when I talk to them or they respond in some shape or fashion. Whether it's coherent or not, that's another, that's another uh, situation. But they actually would respond to verbal, which means that they're alert to verbal. Alert to painful means that, you know, I would give them a painful stimulus uh, such as a sternal rub or you know whatever it is that's recommended in your particular area to do this and then they would wake up and then unconscious so unconscious obviously uh, are they you know completely out of it and then you also want to think about dec uh, decorticate and this the cerebrate posturation and those are other issues that we can we'll go into more uh, depth in the trauma section and then was there a loss of consciousness very important to know lots of people want to know if you know this person did lose consciousness and then regain it back later airway breathing and circulation issues remember these are areas where we're just identifying what the primary patients are and if there's a need for additional resources as well what are priority pr patients well priority patients are considered rap uh, priority for rapid transportation. 
they uh, poor they have a poor general impression you know you you walk up on them and you see that there's loads of issues you know and usually after a lot of time in the field you'll be able to know exactly what this is the second that you walk in the door unresponsive patients uh, that have no gag or cough this can be an issue if they're responsive but they're not following commands remember we talked about what competency was so if there are particular issues as far as their mental competency then those are things that you're going to want to take into consideration as well and difficulty breathing are they really having difficulty breathing can you see uh, that they're struggling for breath and are they in shock is this a complicated childbirth so you know all of these things are going to be priority patients and also not just complicated childbirths but usually childbirths in general are considered to be a priority so you're going to want to you're going to want to really follow a local, local protocol depending on that particular uh, circumstance or situation a chest pain with uh, blood pressure less than 100 systolic uh, that can be an issue as well but again we really want to look at local protocol as far as what priority is on this particular circumstance any un uncontrolled bleeding so you know if you can't get the bleeding to stop or if it the patient's been breathing profusely for a really long time that can be an issue if you have severe pain anywhere and it's difficult to manage then these are patients that you may want to consider as priority patients not all situations are the same and not all the patients that that are in within this category necessitate rapid transportation but rather it's a it's a combination of a variety of signs and symptoms of the patient that will usually tend to lead you towards whether or not this patient is a priority or not. Also, you're going to want to consider advanced life support backup or intercept. Depending on where you are at with this patient, is this uh, the kind of situation that you want to get providers there, other providers, ALS providers on the scene as soon as possible? or is this something where you can transport to the hospital quicker than they can get there and if you are trying to make sure that the patient gets to the hospital as soon as possible you need to also take into consideration how long is it going to take for you to load and unload the patient from your stretcher to a, another stretcher if that's the protocol or how long is it going to take for you to get another provider in your ambulance before you can have them uh, intercept with you. So just lots of different things to keep in mind as far as priority patients are concerned. And then finally, lifespan development. Remember to be cognizant of the age differences. You know, when you have pediatric patients, you're going to have, um, you know, a, a myriad of different vital signs, a different assessment, diagnostic tools, and and those sorts of things, or diagnostic, uh, or rather values is probably the better terminology to use in this particular circumstance. Apologize for that. Uh, and then also be cognizant of, you know, using plain language in all age groups. You want to make sure that you're not overcomplicating matters for people who can't understand what you're saying for little people. So don't try to explain to them complicated procedures just make it as simple as you possibly can because you might scare them with giving them information that is too complex it's just something that you need to keep in mind also school aged children usually 6 to 12 are trusting of EMS personnel when you have kids that are younger age it's not necessarily that they don't trust you, they just rather feel safer around their parents and then uh, those that they're more familiar with. Those that are age uh, 12 and over usually trust will increase um, as the age decreases. So speaking loudly and clearly also um, is the best technique with regard to communicating with elderly patients who might have hearing impairments. So we're not necessarily making it more difficult on ourselves but it's important to make sure that everybody can understand what you have to say and so all across all, all across all age groups you'll be 
you know, encountering lots of different issues. Again, this is a very brief chapter, or a very brief section, rather, and the information contained in this section isn't necessarily a, you know, an entire uh, type of assessment that you would give on a patient. This is just kind of a very brief overview. All right, and that'll do it for this section.